I also want to thank MGI for the remarkable work they've done on this report. Deanna Farrell, the director of the McKinsey Global Institute, will be providing an in-depth summary of the report and its findings shortly, but I thought I'd give a brief preview. Uh, the report is a result of more than a year of research by MGI, including surveying thousands of households, applying new econometric models to existing data, and conducting <coughs> dozens of in-depth interviews with boomers. I would encourage those of you who are so inclined to dig deeply into this data. It's a really a wonderful resource for those of you who are focused on the aging of the baby boomers and all the various ramifications. Uh, the headline on the report really is that uh, despite coming of age during an extraordinary period of prosperity and earning at higher rates throughout their lifetimes than any previous generation, uh, the boomers find themselves as a whole surprisingly unprepared for retirement. <coughs> According to the report, two-thirds of leading-edge boomers will not be able to maintain their current lifestyle once they leave the workforce. For these purposes, that means they will be unable to spend an average of 80% of their current spending throughout the course of their retirement. As a full cohort of 79 million eventually retires, the report projects that their reduced consumption will mean a 25% drop in average annual GDP over the next three decades. So there are ramifications for all of us. That's the bad news. The good news is that the problem is not insurmountable, particularly for the younger boomers who are still years from retirement. As the report notes, this generation has proven itself remarkably adaptive. They've experienced dramatic change in all aspects of American life and have, by and large, found a way to thrive. But there are some serious roadblocks, some in the form of public policy and others that are more attitudinal. Here we mean the perceptions that older workers have of their own retirement and the perceptions of employers toward hiring or keeping on older workers. After we hear from Deanna, Steve Perlstein of the Washington Post will moderate a panel discussion with three experts who bring with them <coughs> tremendous expertise in the areas of demographics, economics, and public policy. Isabel Sawhill is a senior fellow and co-director of the Center on Children and Families at the Brookings Institution. She also served as associate director at OMB under President Clinton. Dr. Sawhill is author or co-author of numerous articles and books on social and economic policy, including Updating America's Social Contract, Economic Growth, and Opportunity in the New Century. She has a piece in the upcoming issue of Democracy Magazine that deals with the intergenerational contract and the choices to be made in allocating federal spending between seniors and children. John Rother is the Executive Vice President of Policy and Strategy for AARP. Beyond the central role Mr. Rother has played uh, in his 24 years with that group, he was, in a previous life, staff director and chief counsel for our host today, the Special Committee on Aging, under then-chairman John Hines. Finally, my colleague Phil Longman is a senior fellow at New America and the research director for the Next Social Contract Initiative. Phil has done some exhaustive work on demographic trends in America and internationally <coughs> and what they pretend for the future, including his book, The Empty Cradle, How Falling Birth Rates Threaten World Prosperity, and What to Do About It. Phil's review of Roger Lowenstein's new book, While America Aged, will appear in this weekend's Washington Post Book World. Before I introduce our distinguished opening speaker, I'd like to talk briefly about New America's next social contract initiative. The initiative is our attempt to grapple with some of the issues that are front and center in the current presidential campaign. The concerns that Americans have about health care, retirement, housing, job security, government spending, and entitlements. We're bringing together the various domestic policy programs at New America to construct a new framework for looking at these issues holistically and matching the rights and responsibilities that are central to the social contract to the realities of a fast-moving 21st century economy. We've included in your packet a one-pager describing the initiative and some of our recent events and publications. I hope you'll visit our website at nextsocialcontract.org or through our main site, newamerica.net. Now it's a pleasure to introduce Senator Herb Cole, the chairman of the Senate Special Committee on Aging, Chairman Cole is serving his fourth term representing the state of Wisconsin. Prior to coming to Washington, he helped build and run the family's grocery and department store chain. The senator has chaired the special committee since January of 2007 and was previously the committee's ranking minority member. He has argued strongly for the renegotiation of pre prescription drug prices in the Medicare Part D program and elimination of the program's donut hole in coverage. Not surprisingly, he has been ahead of the curve in sponsoring legislation to address many of the concerns that the MGI report raises. His Older Workers Opportunity Act would provide tax incentives to employers who hire workers 62 and over on a flexible basis, and his Health Care and Training for Older Workers Act would allow access to extended COBRA coverage to certain older workers as they transition to Medicare, and remove disincentives in Workforce Investment Act programs 
to allow these employees equal access to federally funded training. <laughs> Clearly, he's been a tremendous advocate for the needs of seniors and of the soon to be seniors of the baby boom generation. Please welcome Senator Herb Cole. Thank you very much, Frank. And ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure to be with you this morning. I'm really honored to have been invited here alongside such a distinguished panel of speakers to talk about whether Americans are prepared for retirement. As we know, the study discussed today will reveal that a majority are not prepared for a secure retirement. Many will reach retirement age and will need to continue working as they struggle to stretch their retirement savings. Thankfully, keeping older Americans in the workforce is a good thing for our economy. We've heard from experts at the Federal Reserve that with retirement of tens of millions of baby boomers, the country faces an impending labor shortage that could significantly slow the growth of our economy. Retaining and recruiting older workers is therefore crucial to saving off such a devastating occurrence. To that end, as Frank said, I'm working with others on my committee to make it worthwhile for older Americans to stay in the workforce and for businesses to recruit and train them. <coughs> Overwhelmingly, older Americans want the flexibility later in life to pursue hobbies or visit the grandkids, and many find themselves as a caregiver for a loved one. <coughs> we need to abolish the barriers to part-time work for older workers, such as loss of health coverage, as well as decreases, decreased pension benefits. I have and will continue to work with my Senate colleagues to craft several pieces of common sense legislation to accomplish those goals. So I thank you once again for inviting me here today, and I look forward to continuing to work together to ensure retirement security for all Americans. As Frank pointed out, we are somewhat ahead of the curve, and uh, that gives us a great advantage in putting together the kinds of programs legislatively as well as out across the country to see to it that our older People have an opportunity to work, which many of them not only need to do, but want to do. <coughs> but they need to have a much more flexible, flexible environment in order to pursue this. Businesses, I think, increasingly understand that, and they want to work together with us to see to it that we can accomplish these goals in the future. So it's good to have you here today, and I know we'll be doing many good things together in the future, and it's an honor and a pleasure to have this opportunity to say a few words to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Next, I'd like to introduce Deanna Farrell to walk us through the MGI report. You should all have a copy of Deanna's presentation included in your packet. New America has enjoyed a very productive relationship with Deanna and the McKinsey Global Institute over the years. This is the third event that we have jointly sponsored in Washington with MGI, and it's a pleasure to once again be involved with the release of one of their reports. Deanna has authored numerous articles, op-eds, and books on global <coughs> economic issues, including a recent anthology of McKinsey studies, and is the co-author of Market Unbound, Unleashing Global Capitalism. She's a graduate of Wesleyan University and Harvard Business School, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and of several civic organizations in the Bay Area. Please welcome Deanna Farrell. Um, while the uh, AV equipment gets set up, let me uh, embarrass you for a second and ask how many of you were born uh, in the boomer generation, that is from 1943 to 1964? So we've got 25, uh, 30%. Okay, how many of you were born after 1965? So mostly Janet. Okay, well, there's no question that today the economy <coughs> is uh, dominated by boomers. And you can pick any number of um, <coughs> metrics for how we would know that. Um, in a moment, you'll see, uh, um, you'll see some indication of this. But if we ask how many of today's CEOs are of the boomer generation, the number's about 70%. How many of today's governors are of the boomer generation? Another 70%. How many of the members of Congress 
are of the boomer generation? It's about 60%. How many registered voters are boomers? 60%. So this dominance of the economy is clearly, this is a boomer economy today. Um, and it's worth pausing to reflect on how will their aging affect the economy overall and what things can really be done to, um, to ensure that these sunset years for the boomers and for the economy actually end up in a good place. Um, I will present uh, the highlights of the work that we've done that combines a lot, a lot of the econometric analysis and a lot of psychographic work on boomers themselves. And I'm very honored today to have with us uh, this distinguished panel that will talk a little bit about what are some of the policy implications. And they correspond very well with many of the initiatives that several of these groups have been putting forth. So let me start walking you through this. I um, gave you the highlight of just how dominant they are in the economy. Uh, but if we take uh, a more economic picture of the world, um, consider that since 1980, boomers have been, the, you have some of these in your pack if you have a hard time seeing them. Um, boomers have, since 1980, been the dominant uh, generation. And uh, of course, generations come and go over time, but it's noteworthy that this boomer population is larger as a share of the total population than generations have been or will be going forward. And so we see this period, the boomer era, in fact, starting in 1980, and we see persisting through 2019. Now, interestingly, during this boomer era, the boomers have enjoyed levels of earnings that surpass previous generations by many fold. In growing economies, this is a typical thing. Subsequent generations make more than the parents and grandparents did. Um, and you see that at age 30, each of these lines corresponds to the path of generation's income as they go from the 20s to 30s to 40s and 50s. Um, now, the boomers have not only had higher levels of income at every age, but they've had much steeper increases in the level of income, and they've sustained peak earning years much longer than previous generations have. Um, so this has been, uh, from a generational point of view, a, a boom generation uh, in terms of their ability to earn uh, income. Early boomers, those born between 45 and 54, will peak at 90,000 in 2015, and late boomers will peak uh, north of 106,000 by 2025, orders of magnitude relative to previous generations. Uh, not surprisingly, we've seen a very dramatic increase in aggregate incomes, nearly twofold, 1.7 times uh, from 1985 to 2005. Now, if we come back to a generational look on this, um, say when the boomers when the silence, the previous generation was uh, 45, they, the income of the economy was just north of 1.6 trillion. If you think about the boomers at age 45, their corresponding income is more like 3,700. So it's really a dramatic increase in real terms, even after you adjust for inflation. But I want to pause for a minute about how to think about this income, and particularly how it pertains to future generations and the economy going forward. So we start with the silence and the income level that they had back in 1995 when they were 45 versus the boomers and their income level when they were on average 45. And we see sort of this doubling effect. I'm going to break that down for you a little bit to say what really explains this extraordinary rise. Well, one first thing that explains it, 38% of the <coughs> effect, is simply that this was a much larger generation. Many, many more people in this generation. Uh, 75 million, 79 million boomers um, versus in 45 million households versus 26 million households of the previous generation. So you just had more people, you had more participation in the labor force, no wonder you had slightly higher um, aggregate income. But not only did they have more of them, the boomers lived a very different life than the previous generations. And they did so primarily um, in the relationship of uh, women and women's participation in the labor force, in divorce rates that created single earning households of women, uh, in postponing marriage altogether and having more households. So for any given population, uh, the boomers created more earning households uh, during this period of time. And that helps explain another significant chunk of this. 
Now finally, in addition to having more of them, having them living in more households that were earning, this was a generation that saw extraordinary increases in education, particularly female uh, educational attainment, but overall college attainment. And it was at a time when returns to that education were higher than they'd ever been as the country went transitioned away from a lot of manufacturing to a lot of knowledge work. And this, in effect, education and returns to education, which was a phenomenon of this generation, helps explain another near 30%. <coughs> now, one of the concerning aspects of each of these contributors to growth for the boomer generation is that they were one-time factors. And we are likely, unlikely, to see these played out again in the next generations. Why? Because we know already that future generations are not as large as the boomer population. <coughs> That's not going to change. Uh, and so we're not going to get a boost through more labor input directly from the generations. The social trends that drove even further labor force participation, uh, including the entry of women into the labor force, including the um, larger number of households have pretty much leveled off and they've stabilized. We no longer see increasing number of households for any given population. And similarly, the educational attainment and returns from education are peaking off to some degree. Much more the educational attainment than the returns to that, uh, but what we found in effect is the college attainment rates have leveled off and if you split that off between <coughs> female and male, male college attainment rates have actually started a decline. The flattening is maintained simply because females continue to come into colleges at higher rates. So 80% of the step up that this generation saw relative to previous generations are unlikely to be played out again in future generations. We estimate that the impact of that is to take a base case growth that we had uh, from 1965 to the present, which was around 3.2 down to 2.6 percent. So structurally, unless we have new increases in productivity or some other one-off generational changes, we will see a decline in base case economic growth um, because we won't have these factors. I'll just mention the remaining 20 percent, of course, is just the economic effect of the experience that these boomers lived through. It was a particularly robust period of economic time. And, um, and arguably could or could not be replicated in the future through higher productivity gains or, or otherwise. Um, so this was a generation that dominated the economy, had extraordinary increases in income, even over and above what previous generations had experienced compared to their parents and grandparents. Uh, sadly, most of this were one-off factors. Now, despite these much, much higher levels of earnings, one thing that characterized this generation was that they did not save against those earnings uh, to any degree as previous generations had. So if you think about, again, the life cycle of savings, well documented historically, households tend to have modest levels of savings. As they reach their peak income years, this is in the 40s and 50s, they save significantly more. That becomes the stockpile that they then dissave from to keep themselves into retirement. And we see the early silent cohort in that generation did precisely that. The late silent did that, maybe not quite as thriftily, but still had a very clear <coughs> peak to their saving cycle. And what about the boomers? Boomers have a very different story. There's a missing peak. Boomers had a more rapid ramp up in income. They've had an extended period of peak earnings, but they did not translate that higher peak earnings into that kind of savings peak. This, of course, is another way of understanding why our savings rates have dropped in this country. Generations of this age group have sustained the saving rate. This generation did not. Now, you would ask, why didn't they? What, what was so different about this generation? And there are many psychological explanations for all that. Um, the, as an economist, I would point to two things. One is uh, the wealth effect and how much it played into the boomer household experience. Uh, this was a time when most boomers um, who had households saw their houses, who had houses saw the value of those houses increase. That made them feel wealthy and it made them feel like they didn't need to save. We also had a number of boomers uh, participate in financial asset appreciation, which was unprecedented. Again, a wealth effect that gave them no reason to uh, be concerned about spending their income. 
In addition to the wealth effect, the easy availability of credit, the degree to which mortgages and credit cards and other asset-backed loans could uh, be secured, encouraged a lot more consumption than might have otherwise been the case. Uh, so we see that mortgage uh, rates, for example, uh, increased, doubled by, for this generation previous to gen uh, other generations. Uh, net liability to net worth of a household is 1.5 times for boomers what it was for silence. And so in effect, we don't have this resilience to deal with the sunset years that the boomers are about to enter. It's not surprising, therefore, to learn that most of these boomers will be unprepared for their sunset years, for retirement. Now, how do we define being prepared, not prepared? Um, if you observe <coughs> households over various generations, those that have been able to maintain their lifestyles have been able to do so by keeping at least, or approximately, 80% of their consumption and through uh, savings or other access to income. And what we find is that if you consider only their financial assets, um, only 31% of the boomer population is actually prepared, meaning able to sustain up to 80% of their current consumption. Um, now, even if you say they might be able to monetize their home equity, we find that only 62% of them are really prepared to sustain their lifestyle. Now, let me point out that this is, uh, at a time, a snapshot of real estate as we saw it at the beginning of 2007. Uh, this real estate situation continues uh, to get worse, and therefore this picture will get worse. Uh, in fact, we estimate that another full $4 trillion of home values will be wiped out over the next while, and that will be reflected in these balance sheets. Uh, so if anything, this is an optimistic view of how many people will be prepared. Now, of course, not all boomers are the same, and I want to spend a moment talking about the different segments of boomers, because any successful policy will have to target uh, some of these in different ways. <coughs> I will start with the um, confident. Uh, now, this is psychographic characteristics of boomers. And what we find is just south of 50% are what we would characterize as confident. They uh, look forward to their years of retirement. They are, by and large, the richest, the healthiest, the best educated. They're optimistic. They're mostly married. Uh, their average after-tax income is about 111000 and they have a net worth of 878000 Now, this is a group that is probably, at least attitudinally, going to be fine. Um, however, we split off about half of this group, half this attitude, but if you look at their financial situation, it looks a lot more like their neighbors next door, the vulnerable segment. Now, what is this group like? This is about a quarter of the boomers. From a financial point of view, another 25% of this confident group is really in this camp. <coughs> they have much lower incomes, 86,000 uh, mean income, uh, net worth just south of 400,000. Uh, these groups have uh, lower levels of education, they're less likely to be married, they're more likely to have some kind of health problem <coughs> or another, and they worry very much about their finances, their health, being lonely. They are frustrated in, in their lives as they go into retirement, and they do not believe that either family nor government will be there fully to support them. This is an anxious group, and when you look at the financial situation, you can begin to understand why. Uh, but there's a group that is even worse off here. This is another quarter of the boomers. We call these the disadvantaged. Uh, these um, have much, much lower levels of education. Throughout their lives, they have enjoyed, or not enjoyed, very particularly high levels of income. Uh, they're much less likely to be married. They're more likely to be female and uneducated. And uh, they really represent the least healthy component of the economy. They correctly worry about the affordability of health care, the sustainability of government programs, and about three quarters to 80% of this group are truly unprepared uh, to sustain even a very meek level of living. Their average income is south of $20,000 a year, and their median net worth is non existent. They have no net worth uh, to speak of. Now, look across these various segments, it's, it's a bleak picture, except for 25% of confident and affluent who will be just fine, 
um, all the other pockets of vulnerability or disadvantage suggest some challenge to the current uh, system. Now, before we get too depressed, this is not the most uh, encouraging picture, there are a few things that can and must be done to improve this profile as it stands. And we would start with the importance of prolonging the savings accumulation uh, period. That, that in some senses is the most important thing we can do, is go back to those curves and create a period of time over which the pocket of savings is created to provide resilience for these sunset years. Now, we find that if we could do that, if we could in fact in increase the asset accumulation period for about five years, we could change these numbers pretty significantly. We could double the number of people who would be prepared um, in these scenarios, and all the more so if we assume that they can tap into some of their home equity. Now, there are two ways of doing this. Uh, we can either ask people to work longer, and in that way continue accumulating assets over time, or we can ask them to spend less, and in that way save uh, more. Now, from an individual household, most people would have a different way of weighting those two options, working longer, consuming less. But from an economy point of view, there's no question that the economy is stronger if we keep people working longer. Um, and this is because, of course, this gets back to the role that this generation has played in providing labor into the economy. We take that labor out and we reduce potential GDP. And when you see here the consequences of, of choice of working longer versus just consuming less is not only seen in the aggregate GDP growth numbers, but in the aggregate real dollar value in numbers. Um, increasing working lives by close to two years, which is what we've set this target at, uh, would have a real impact on GDP growth. Say, for example, from 2007 to 2016, uh, 0.3 percent increase relative to the base case, which cumulatively over this period of time is 13 trillion dollars. I mean, it's very meaningful versus a slowdown relative to the base case if we actually have uh, people taking out consumption from the economy. Because consumption, of course, fuels uh, growth in the economy. Now, fortunately, boomers, for the most part, know that they will have to work. If we survey boomers, 85% of them say it's extremely likely, very likely, or somewhat likely that they will have to work uh, going forward. Uh, only 38% of them see the picture as it really is, which is it is very likely or extremely likely they, they should and will need to. Uh, but most of them understand the reason at the end of the day is a financial reason. They have not really uh, put the means <coughs> together to deliver on the lifestyle that they've become accustomed to. Now, you could say to yourself, that sounds great, not such a big problem, we just have to increase working lives by two years. Why don't we just do that? Now that's uh, politically a very difficult thing for you to do, and it's appropriate that we are in this building today uh, to say that. If you consider that from 1970 to 2002, we've had a decrease in the retirement age by about two years. The task is to reverse that trend and then surpass it, and to do so in less time than that decrease took place. Um, having said that, the value to the individual households, to the economy, is paramount. And even with this, we don't solve the entire problem. Because we know that many of these boomers, even if they are willing to work and would like to work, may not be able to work. And they may not be able to work because they'll have health problems or other uh, conditions. Um, and this is, of course, all the more true for that disadvantaged group, which is the group that most needs to work. Um, now, we also find that boomers to fulfill on this promise of working longer will have to switch jobs because today they are in construction jobs, in other production jobs that are physically demanding. Any of you who know relatives or others who have switched jobs later in life know that's a very difficult thing to do. And so it is a necessary, imperative, I would argue, task to increase working lives. It's going to be a very difficult thing politically and realistically uh, given the physical constraints, health constraints and otherwise. Um, now let me just point out that we must do this for the entire vulnerable group I just described, but it will not be enough. Uh, because that last segment of disadvantaged folks, even if we instill the long working longer scenario, will face some pretty bleak uh, prospects. You consider that 95% of those unprepared households, many of whom are in the disadvantaged category, 
will have a net worth of less than $100,000, uh, even if they were funded. And <coughs> as healthcare costs continue to do what they're doing, as other um, life events play out, this will not be enough. The government programs that have sustained these people, the reason these government programs were instituted in the first place, arguably, will still be a challenge for policy. Working longer and continuing on the track of um, support that is in play today that is not uh, necessarily on the best financial foot. What uh, can be done? Uh, here I will defer mostly to the panel that comes after me, but based on the work we've done, uh, we would highlight three principles that are essential in dealing with this problem and that we think maybe aren't getting quite as much attention as they would. Um, we hear in circles around these hallways uh, the importance of health care. Health care is not just an issue of universal access. It's not just an issue of cost. It's actually essential to keeping older people working longer. As we survey companies, which we do all the time through our consulting work, uh, one of the challenges of keeping people working longer is, of course, that their health care benefits become exorbitantly expensive and prohibitively expensive. So figuring out how we reallocate the health care component to keep people working longer, um, even as we worry about universal access and reducing health care costs, is going to be an essential element of this. Secondly, we need to uh, promote and remove the disincentives to for people to work longer. And uh, we say, uh, we hear from companies over and over again that they are very fearful of the web of federal legislation that they might come up against if they start making special rules for older workers in terms of age discrimination, in terms of other uh, compliance. And while one wants to make sure that that legislation is in place to protect people, it is now working as a huge disincentive for companies to think flexibly about <coughs> how to employ older workers. And in fact, most have <coughs> mechanisms to drive older workers out, even when it's not in their own interest. Uh, arguably, the government has done a better job of making some of these arrangements work. We need to expand that further. Uh, finally, and I say this not politically <coughs> because I know this is a very, very big and important thing, we need to um, remove the disincentives to work longer that are embedded in both private pension plans and in the social security system. Uh, so most of the defined benefit programs, for example, are calculated <coughs> benefits according to formulas that are actually built in to get people to retire early. And that um, uh, has legacy behind it, but we need to get in that and through some combination of legislation and statesman and business statesman leadership uh, change that. Arguably, Social Security <coughs> too has the same kinds of disincentives. Uh, working longer than 35 years actually works against somebody uh, in, in the access they have to benefits. So, in, in recap, we have a situation here which is um, a generation that through its size and sheer innovation, social innovation, uh, its entry of women and otherwise, really transformed the earnings picture, uh, but failed to translate that <coughs> into uh, savings and resilience picture. Um, we are faced now with the situation that it is the boomers themselves who are in the key positions of government, in the key positions of business, and we must once again turn to this generation to reinvent itself, reinvent retirement, reinvent the workforce, and ensure that their aging is actually a good thing for the economy. Now I'm going to hand things off to Steve Perlstein to moderate our panel discussion. Steve's is truly a remarkable resume. Uh, he's lived the life of the itinerant journalist. He, he began his career right out of Trinity College writing for two smaller papers in New Hampshire. He's been a reporter for Boston's public television outlet, started his own monthly magazine, written for Inc. Magazine, been an editor and roving economic reporter for the Washington Post, and most recently been the Post's business columnist. Somehow, in the midst of all that, he found time to serve as a press secretary and administrative <coughs> assistant to Senator John Durkin of New Hampshire and Representative Michael Harrington of Massachusetts. 
For good measure, he pursued public service in his two terms as the town moderator of West Newbury, Massachusetts, which makes him uniquely qualified for his role today. Mm -hmm. Steve is best known for winning this year's Pulitzer Prize for his insightful commentary on financial markets, in which he predicted many of the crises we are currently experiencing, particularly the housing and credit slumps. He is the first columnist writing solely on business issues to ever win the Pulitzer. Please welcome Steve Perlstein and our panel. Um, you know, I see all of you standing up, so let's see if we can uh, more efficiently sort the seats here. We have two seats up here, and why don't we get our panel? <coughs> Phil, do you want to come over here? So we have we have a few seats up here, right in the front. Three. I'll move over here. So that's as well. Okay. Well, good morning. If you think that's bad, imagine what it's like in France where they work 35 hours a week and retire at 55. <laughs> um, he'll have one more seat. Uh, why don't we, um, the, the biographies of, the, um, of our panelists are um, in your packets and I'm not going to read from them, but this is a great panel. Uh, they know what they're talking about, so I'm not going to do any talking. So why don't we ask them just first to react to the uh, findings and the sort of statistical findings of um, the McKinsey report and uh, see if they have any disagreements with it or any um, things they want to add to it that, that, that you think are important. Phil, why don't you uh, start? Okay, well, I think this is a very important uh, report, and I agree with most of it. Um, but I'm, I'm a bit concerned about the way it's packaged, if you read it superficially. What, what is the headline? The headline is, uh, baby boomers earned more than any other generation at every, every point in their life, but didn't spend anything, didn't and save that, didn't, didn't save anything. And that plays right into the uh, spendthrift, yuppie stereotype. Um, that has largely defined this generation. Um, and I'm very concerned um, because of the political consequences of that stereotype and also just how untrue to the actual um, story of the baby boom generation. When I, when I looked at, um, I first saw the report, I saw the graph that you've seen showing uh, the household income uh, for various cohorts of the baby boom. And I saw that number 85,000 from people my age, and I looked at that and I said, that, that, just, that just can't be. I'm here in Washington, um, I know plenty of yuppies that make more than $85,000, but consider the country <coughs> as a whole, consider that most baby boomers didn't go to college, didn't finish college. That number just seems so too high to me. So I hopped over to the uh, uh, <coughs> Census Bureau and, and looked it up, and, and sure enough, the 85,000 number was ballpark um, with their number uh, for average income of the baby boom generation. But medium income was $20,000 less. Now what does that tell you when you got such a big difference? That tells you that income inequality within the baby boom generation is huge. If you're talking average income, Bill Gates is in that average. All kinds of big mansion owners and, and minor millionaires are in that average. Half, half of baby boomers um, have, at, at this point in their life, um, only $64,000 of median income. That's typically two paycheck family. And 30% uh, uh, or 20% have, have less than 30000 So there's an enormous disparity there. Um, and the implication of that is that, that the typical baby boomer, boomer wasn't as as rich as the average number would suggest, so therefore maybe wasn't as spendthrift. Well, that's right, and um, that brings me to the, the second point I want to bring out. Um, why did why didn't these baby donors save as much as their parents? Well, I agree with the factors stated, but there's one factor that is just huge that hasn't been stated, and that's payroll tax. When my grandfather was saving to send my father to college, the payroll tax in 
employer employee was 2%. When my father was saving to buy his first house in the 1950s, payroll tax was 3%. When the first baby boomers got their first summer jobs in the early 60s, the payroll tax was 7.5%. By the time I got my first job in the early 70s, it was 11%. And now it's 5.3%. And has been since 1990. Well, that's almost one out of seven dollars you earn. 5.3, you I'm sorry, 15.3. 15.3, almost one out of every seven dollars you earn. Well, of course, part of that 15.3 uh, came from a decision that was taken in a Ramada Inn in Arlington, Virginia in 1982 when Social Security was broke and the President and the leaders of House and Senate appointed a special commission to figure out how we were going to get Social Security solved and they said we're going to have an artful compromise between cutting taxes and uh, uh, raising taxes and cutting benefits and they said well we're going to raise the taxes on baby boomers and subsequent generations and, and lower their benefits but then we also got a plan so that we never get to this moment again. We're not going to just raise payroll taxes enough to fund the Social Security system. We're going to pay, we're going to raise them even more to pre-fund the, the baby boomers' retirement. Baby boomers are going to have to pay for some part of their own retirement benefits. That was the plan. And so we have these extra about 2.1 uh, percentage point payroll tax on top of that. And it was all supposed to go into this lockbox. Remember the lockbox? Yeah. Right? It's down the hall. <laughs> you know, you know, well, maybe down the hall, but if you opened it up and looked inside, um, I mean, the plan was, right? That this was an effectively a mandated savings plan on the baby boom generation. They did the savings, it went into the lockbox, and then it came out of the lockbox to pay for tax cuts and military buildups and everything else the government does. And now we're now we're at the, the sort of moment of truth when uh, it's time to go to the lockbox and call back the benefits, um, and there's not you know nothing's there, and Social Security is within a few years will be running a cash flow deficit. The rest of government will not be able to live <coughs> off the, the retirement or what the pseudo retirement savings of the baby boom generation anymore, and well it'll be a whole new atmosphere. But that's. That's a major point. And I, I just conclude with one third thing, is that if the value of early savings, if the average baby boomer, in 19, or 25 year old baby boomer in 1983 made $14,000 a year on average, household income. If he paid a 2.1 mandatory savings plan, that would have <coughs> created about $300 in savings that year. Well, now we can look back with the benefit of hindsight. And we know that the S&P 500 over that period, from that period to now, it's gone up and down. But over that period, it's averaged 10.9% when I looked it up the other day. If you do the math, you realize that if you take some, somebody who was 25 years old in 1983 and earned the median income throughout their life, and, and, and assume that they'll continue to earn the median <coughs> income the remainder of their working life, um, and if they had paid a 2.1 payroll tax, and don't even assume that the stock market is going to go up like it has in the past, assume that it's basically 5% in the future. We, we would be looking at people my age coming into retirement at age 67 with ne nest eggs of about $450,000. Um, coulda, woulda, shoulda. You know, coulda, woulda, shoulda. Um, I don't mean to dwell on the past so much, but this is a powerful lesson when it comes to thinking about what to do in the future, particularly for young people. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have this happen again. And I would say not only should we have mandated savings on uh, young folks, I would say start with baby bonds. Start with endowing people at birth so that they begin to build up this financial uh, momentum. Now, Albert Einstein called compound interest the greatest miracle in the universe. And it really is. If you look at what the growth curves are for somebody who can put $300 away at age 25, it's just astounding. And one could add to that in terms of the spendthrift, uh, which we see in Deanna's data in, in, in sort of both sides of the equation. Baby boomers spent more for housing 
than the previous generation. They also have assets that are valued higher, in part because they spend more for housing. But it, it shows on both sides. But in terms of where was the money to save, well, sometimes the money to save went to buying and sustaining this house, which now is worth more, and they can draw down later. But um, And I think that's a good idea for, for, for monetizing. And when you did the balance sheet for monetizing the household um, assets, that, that, um, that's probably a fair way of doing it. So we look a little less spendthrift. Um, uh, <coughs> well, first of all, let me make a confession. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a member of the silent generation. Uh, Deanna was too polite to ask those of us who are members of the silent generation to raise our hands. But of course, uh, uh, we worked hard and we saved a lot, and we are morally superior generation. <laughs> so get that. Uh, and so you can take uh, all my comments in that vein. My other confession is that my late husband was a uh, longtime um, McKinseyite, uh, both an associate when he was young and later a, a partner. And uh, I have to tell one anecdote about that to uh, make the point about how different culturally this, uh, these younger generations are from our generation. When my husband was a young McKinsey associate, he got chewed out by a senior member of the firm for not wearing a hat to work. <laughs> uh, believe it or not. And you never went on a client visit without your hat. Uh, so, uh, you know, this, uh, times have changed. So I think this is a great report. Uh, it's full of wonderful data and uh, charts. Uh, uh, I couldn't get through all of it uh, yesterday, but uh, I found what I did uh, have a chance to read uh, very uh, incisive and very uh, interesting. I think it is a wake-up call to, uh, to older workers and to the business community and perhaps to government. We can come back to that. Uh, there does seem to be a problem and the report uh, lays it out uh, well. Now having said that, I want to uh, make a little bit of a counter argument here just to, uh, to keep it interesting and say that you know depending upon your perspective we could we could make an argument that there's a bit of exaggeration uh, here uh, everybody likes to focus on a particular problem and say you know this is the problem to sure this is the worst problem we have as a society but you know wait until I tell you about the about the next one um, uh, first of all, keep in mind what uh, Deanna also emphasized, which is this is the wealthiest, highest income generation ever by a large magnitude. So it's not like they don't have the wherewithal uh, to uh, retire. Um, they are also, I would add, healthier than any previous generation, therefore able to work longer. And um, uh, this, is, this has to be factored in as well, I think. Uh, now, I think the lack of awareness uh, that the report cites is a problem. I mean, this, this surprises me. Well, it doesn't surprise me completely. I certainly even have friends who seem to me to not have focused on what they're going to do in, reti in retirement. It does seem to me that uh, we need the wake-up call for that reason alone. People need to do uh, some <coughs> financial uh, planning, and uh, maybe when we get to a more policy-oriented discussion, I'll come back to that. Uh, well, let me mention it now because it uh, fits in nicely. Uh, think about these uh, automatic enrollment plans and 401ks that are all the rage now, and uh, for good reasons, I think. But, you know, you could imagine companies taking on the responsibility to say to their workers, uh, we want to sign you up for this plan automatically, unless you choose to opt out, and we're going to match your contributions to your plan. But we're going to um, uh, ask, almost require, that you do a financial plan, and maybe they have a uh, mechanism on their website that makes this easy to do, a, a financial planning instrument. And everybody has to go through that, and then maybe the, the uh, automatic uh, deductions are linked in some way to the financial planning needs of that individual uh, worker. I mean, I think that would be an interesting conversation 
uh, to have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, on the fact that their um, savings less because of this so-called wealth effect, because as Steve just said, they're putting so much into their houses and to some extent into the stock market or other financial assets. Um, I think that the, the, the report has a uh, tone, and Deanna said it as well, that, well, uh, this, is, this is just before the storm. In other words, things are going to get a lot worse before they get better in terms of the values of those assets. On the other hand, um, it seems to me that the value of those assets is going to come back again, and if people don't do something <coughs> dumb, like sell their house or sell their stock portfolio when the market is down, um, they should be okay, or at least we don't know. I mean, they may be okay. All of those asset values uh, maybe uh, will come uh, back again. And so I think that it's perfectly rational uh, to some extent if you haven't um, valued your assets at the very peak uh, to have taken that into <coughs> account when you do your savings because those assets can be uh, monetized. Um, now, on this target issue, you know, should we expect people to consume at 80% of the level that they consumed in their last working year? Uh, that's uh, forever debatable. Uh, maybe uh, people eat peanut butter when their children are young and they're sending them to college, and then they eat steak when they get the kids out of the house, and they go back to eating peanut butter when they're old again. And, uh, I mean, that sounds awful, but, I mean, the point is you shouldn't necessarily benchmark this on the uh, very last and possibly highest uh, year of your, of your earnings. Um, and maybe people uh, are revealing their preference uh, by doing this. This is the economist's favorite term for saying, well, people have different um, uh, tastes with respect to how much they save when they're young and how much money they have when they're old. You know, my generation had high taste for saving. The boomer generation uh, doesn't seem to want to do uh, as much. But that goes back to whether that's a, uh, their, their, their understanding um, the level of living that they're uh, going to have when they're old or whether they are not. Um, big changes or, or big uh, amounts of inequality in this generation as uh, has already been noted. And so I think we should have a very different uh, approach or response to those who are in the more disadvantaged or vulnerable groups than to those who are in the more confident and well-off groups. To, and to my way of thinking, and I've just written an article on this, which I'm happy to uh, give to some of you if I have some left. Uh, it's coming out next week in um, a little journal called Democracy, if I can advertise it for a moment. Uh, those who are well off, I think, should be um, paying their own way and even maybe getting less in future Social Security uh, benefits than they uh, are currently promised. Um, obviously, unexpected health care costs are huge, and um, unexpected health care costs leads me to recommend that we move more towards uh, a catastrophic plan backed up by uh, the government, and uh, obviously coverage for uh, lower wage and, and maybe even middle income workers, but again, uh, not so much uh, for the well-off. Uh, I think uh, uh, one more point, and then I'll stop. Um, of the two responses that Deanna talked about, you can work longer, or you can save more. Um, she emphasized that working longer has macroeconomic effects that are positive because it increases uh, potential GDP, and I think that's true. But I think I'm not sure I want to focus on aggregate GDP as a measure of welfare. The advantage of savings more is you get a double dividend from it. You both reduce your consumption level when you're younger, 
and therefore don't feel like you're having to reduce your standard of living as much because you don't get used to such a high standard of living to begin with, and you're making it easier to uh, fund that retirement. So I would put in a stronger plug <coughs> for the, uh, I mean, I think both responses are appropriate, but I think the savings response has some extra bang to it. Particularly for the younger, you know, the, the, the earlier, uh, mm -hmm. what do you call them? The late boomers, I guess is what you call them. Well, John Rother of the AAUP, there seems to be some movement here for people working longer, and there's a suggestion of cutting of, of means testing benefits. Um, what, do you, what do you have to say about those two ideas, or, or any other? I, I, you know, in uh, kindergarten, I learned there are two questions in life. Oh, yeah, and so what? And I thought you were going to ask me the oh, yeah question first. Uh, and that is, uh, what, you know, what about uh, the validity of this report? And I, I just want to say I think it's a terrific report uh, with a lot uh, to offer. ARP has also done uh, quite a bit of work on this. I don't have enough for everybody, but I'll just, uh, in the last year, we've put out uh, fairly major reports on how boomers will fare in retirement. Uh, given the bad news on the low income front, we uh, commissioned a <coughs> special report on the future prospects of lower income boomers. And then we've also done something just recently on uh, the impact on the boomer generation of the economic slowdown. So uh, those are all available if anyone's interested. But uh, I think I'd like to make a, a couple of additional remarks just about uh, how to understand this before we go on to the policy implications. Um, it seems to me that uh, uh, many boomers live in the same state, and that's the state of denial. Uh, and uh, you, you wonder why they are more in denial than in their older uh, <coughs> parents. And you, you think, well, okay, so what in their life experience has uh, taught them uh, about the need for sacrifice and the need for deferred uh, consumption? Nothing nothing in the boomers experience that would say uh, you have to save for the future uh, they've experienced <coughs> rising incomes they've experienced rising how housing values rising equity markets uh, and they've been able to uh, access credit much more so than the previous generations um, so there's not much there to build on and as a result well and let's not even forget the advertising and all the uh, signals that you get from the economy uh, to consume now and put it on your credit card. And so uh, debt has been rising. Uh, alarming to us, uh, debt has been rising among early retirees uh, so that they're carrying the same credit card balances that working people are. Uh, so this, I think, is more than economics. This is a <coughs> cultural shift, um, shift in attitudes uh, that has pretty profound implications. And uh, I, would, I would emphasize that. And John, I uh, would we'll point out that this state of denial also has a lot, seems to have a lot of electoral votes. Well, <laughs> disproportionate. That's a whole other discussion. <laughs> uh, you know, hope lives forever, right? But uh, I, I, I do want to point out a couple of things. One, uh, the importance of health care costs. Uh, the trends in health care are, are truly alarming if the uh, current trends continue. Uh, this will be the major economic fact of life for retirees <coughs> uh, because Medicare today covers a, approximately half of total health care costs and the uh, balance is truly uh, much larger than most people understand. EBRI did a uh, report that said a couple uh, at retirement who um, live a, a median number of years uh, needs to have about three hundred thousand uh, dollars socked away just for out-of-pocket health care costs. Mm -hmm. And should, you know, uh, they be so unfortunate as to live much longer, as many will, then those numbers go up quite a bit. So, uh, you know, health care uh, deserves a separate look. And when we get to the policy uh, discussion, that's number one, because that's the main economic threat, not only, of course, to retirees, but to working people as well. Uh, the other point I want to make is about housing. I, I. Um, I wonder about uh, the argument that uh, because you are living in a house that's worth something, that that means you will have a more secure retirement. Uh, very few boomers move. 
uh, to cash in. Very few, uh, in fact, a tiny number, uh, enter into reverse mortgages uh, among today's retirees. Uh, I'm not seeing a lot of uh, effort <coughs> to uh, convert the home equity to uh, uh, you know usable income. And uh, I think it may be a mistake to uh, uh, analytically to look at, at the home equity as equivalent to uh, retirement balances and 401ks and IRA accounts and that kind of thing. So I, I do think the picture is continuously <coughs> better and worse. I think uh, the conclusion about working longer um, is absolutely the right message. Uh, and um, it may be a surprise to people uh, it's certainly not conventional political wisdom that um, ideas about uh, possibly changing the early retirement age of Social Security are, uh, are more acceptable than you might think among uh, boomers. They, they expect to work longer than 62, even though the median age of retirement is still 62, 63, um, most boomers expect to work longer. And, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest to anyone that they change the normal retirement age because 67 is still an age where you <coughs> you don't see uh, too many employers hiring. But uh, certainly, I think uh, the early retirement age is is an uh, area that's uh, open for uh, debate and consideration. This report, I think, uh, really gives a lot of uh, support, not only to voluntarily working longer, but perhaps even to changing. Social Security policy. John, did, does your does your surveys indicate that people expect to work? work <coughs> are they um, unhappy about that? Well, here I think we have to go back to the not all boomers are the same, and I, um, you know, those of us in this room, uh, people who are highly educated who have <coughs> jobs, have a completely different attitude about work than those who are, um, you know, waitresses and. Uh, people who are, are doing uh, things that are hard physically. I, I think that there's uh, more and more people with higher education doing interesting work who are, frankly, can't imagine not working. Right. And uh, then there are uh, others who uh, will need job retraining and go into different careers, maybe less demanding. Uh, and then there are people who, uh, who are worn out physically and uh, will need some additional help, some kind of a disability uh, program that actually works as opposed to the one we have now. Uh, but I think those, uh, you have to kind of look at the different segments. Mm -hmm. But I think that as more and more people are um, in uh, white collar workforce, uh, those are the people who uh, can imagine working longer and you can, you can see why. And it's not, um, I don't think it would be a difficult sell uh, to them. Now, for people who are uh, in manufacturing or you know coal mining, whatever, uh, you would have to really have some special accommodations. Let's uh, talk a little bit about about policy prescriptions and solutions. Um, Phil, is there anything? Um, uh, what would be your uh, top priority uh, for dealing with this? Uh, my top priority for dealing with this as with many other things, um, is health care. I mean, it just is the piece of paper to talk about. Right. Um, you don't get on top of that. There's no point in talking really about anything else. Um, I think the state of debate on health care today is, is very unfortunate. Um, I published a book last year called uh, Best Care Anywhere, which um, came out of an assignment I had from Fortune magazine to go out and find where it was the, the Jack Welsh of healthcare. And I spent about a year trying to find the Jack Welsh of healthcare and uh, equating myself with all the econometrics of uh, quality in healthcare, <coughs> the literature on that, talking to all the experts. And they kept telling me this answer I couldn't believe, that the Jack Welsh of healthcare was this government employee named Ken Kaiser, who ran at that time the Veterans Administration. Veterans Health Administration. Um, I think the VA model of care, uh, which is cradle to grave, um, is um, very important. Um, but that's, of course, to some extent off subject because, uh, but it, 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 you just have to keep coming back to it unless you can get your head around health care. The other thing, uh, 
this is this is another aspect of health care, but I, I I think when I look at the trends in obesity, particularly um, of middle-aged people and younger, uh, we're already seeing increases in age-specific disability rates, mostly because of that obesity trend. Uh, we spent all this time trying to persuade people not to smoke. Well, smoking <laughs> from a public finance point of view. I'll be careful, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, right? I mean, you tend to die at 65, 100% a one-year mortality, <coughs> cancer, right? Uh, you know, you, you collect one or two years of Social Security, no Medicare or very little Medicare, and you're out of there, right? <laughs> right? That's why uh, That's Czechoslovakia and other countries, you know, thought about encouraging smoking, but wait, obesity <laughs> <laughs> is completely different. Right? It's <coughs> chronic, expensive, and I think we have to put a huge emphasis on public health, um, not only for fiscal reasons, but, but just so that people can waddle their way to work. And the third large category is, is turning the corner on, on thrift, Re reinventing <coughs> thrift as a cultural uh, value. Um, particularly among the young. Reinstilling the savings habit, enabling young people um, to save, um, using the benefits of beha behavioral economics, what we're starting to get to know about how easy it is to sort of just nudge people a little bit mm -hmm. to, to save more um, by doing things like making 401k defaults. Uh, I, I, think, <coughs> I think we should have a mandated 2% uh, um, savings uh, system in this country as an add-on to Social Security, at the very least. So then a big picture approach. Okay. Bill? Uh, I actually think I uh, agree with that. Um, I mean, I would, health care is obviously a huge issue. I'm not sure how relevant it is to this issue we're talking about um, today. I mean, uh, seniors are the only group that have uh, universal health care right now. It's the working age population <coughs> that doesn't. As John says, there is a problem uh, in terms of coverage, uh, and I think that some more ca catastrophic coverage is in order. But um, the biggest <coughs> problems here are uh, that we're not saving enough as a country, and we're not saving enough privately, and we're just saving publicly because we're running huge uh, government deficits that are going to explode over the next uh, few decades as this baby boom generation retires. And as uh, the report nicely points out, it has been the lack of saving in this very large generation that has caused our savings rate to come, go from, you know, 10 or 12 percent down to 1 or 2 percent. And that's an economic problem for the country. Uh, so I come out somewhat similarly to um, Phil that uh, we need to encourage uh, more uh, private saving as well as get the uh, government deficits under control. And for encouraging private savings amongst the younger generation so we don't repeat this mistake, so to speak, is going to require, I think, more emphasis on uh, automatic enrollment in 401ks and, as I said before, maybe going beyond that I'm like Phil, very enamored, uh, like you, uh, Steve, enamored with the lessons that are coming out of behavioral economics and what some people call soft paternalism. And I think we are going to need to nudge people. Uh, maybe we need private uh, accounts on top of Social Security, not as a carve out, uh, where people are mandated to save an extra, let's say, 2% and put it in a private account and they then control it, but um, it isn't something that is voluntary necessarily. And one of the interesting things about a proposal like that is it isn't quite a tax. On the other hand, it has some of the benefits of a tax. So it might solve some of the political problems when you start talking about raising taxes uh, as opposed to mandating that people uh, save more. So I like the idea of some <coughs> greater mandatory savings as an add-on to the current uh, Social Security system. Now, Bell is also in her paper recommending that 
um, some of the benefits of Social Security, and I, I am, am inferring also Medicare be somewhat means tested so that the more affluent um, among us um, don't get quite as much benefit as we do now, or at least it doesn't grow as much in the future as it is supposed to grow. Um, John, uh, are you willing to live with that? It's very important to stress the latter. Not less than the people get now, but less, less than they're promised to get 20 years from now. Yeah, I do think uh, it's important to look at this in terms of the socioeconomic <coughs> situation. I, I think the report does a good job of, uh, in effect, saying we've got three groups here. We've got the top 25% who are pretty well fixed. They have pensions, they have homes, uh, good jobs, good health insurance. We have a kind of a middle group of 50% that's uh, pretty vulnerable, actually, but uh, could probably work their way out of this literally by just staying employed for another couple of years. And then we have a group that's uh, the bottom 25% that uh, basically uh, cannot do this on their own and they're going to need help. So I do think that that means uh, some changes in social policy. Um, and I think there are five key areas. I can just go through them and respond mm -hmm. to your question. I think uh, in, I'm in agreement with Phil and Bell, uh, health care is the, is the key one, and especially for older people because they're the ones that uh, <coughs> use the most health care and that I think increasingly in the future will be incurring uh, the costs over an ever lengthening uh, lifespan. Uh, so, uh, cost of health care, the quality of health care, the affordability uh, to the individual is absolutely critical. Um, second area is um, I agree with the report recommendations on working longer. Um, key elements there include job retraining because you're not going to have the same job for an entire life and uh, ma making Medicare primary again, uh, which is a policy that we used to have in this country, um, that uh, once you turn 65 and are eligible for Medicare, uh, you took the load off your employer-based insurance and it made you uh, much more attractive to the employer. Uh, Do we know how much that would cost, roughly? Two, two billion. Two billion a year? Yeah, but the, uh, the benefit would be much greater in terms of the additional uh, when did that happen? I was in 1980. 83. 83. Part of the same. Uh, about it in reform. Uh, maybe it was 86. Uh, but I think it was later. Yeah, but it was, it was in the 80s, and, and it was uh, a policy done, in, <coughs> obviously, here in the Senate when it happened, uh, mostly for short term fiscal gain, uh, and people didn't even think about the uh, impact on the economy, mm -hmm. uh, about the incentives. About the flexibility of the labor market. Yeah. So health care costs, working longer. Third one is Social Security. Uh, we need to do Social Security for lots of reasons. But I think what this report points out is that um, with the erosion of pensions and inadequate savings, there's not a lot of downside room on Social Security in terms of maintaining some kind of adequate floor, especially for <coughs> people at the lower end. And um, here, I think, um, well, the experience of uh, community groups that we sponsor uh, when they kind of try to come to grips with Social Security's future <coughs> is pretty relevant. And that is, um, I've never yet met a, a group of people in the community who would cut benefits for the bottom half of Social Security recipients. And I've never met a single group that would do that. Uh, Nobody's but, talking about doing that either. Well, <laughs> but even when you explain it, um, I think what they would almost uh, uniformly say is, we should slow down the rate of growth for those at the top. Mm -hmm. And we should ask those at the top to pay more during their working lives as well. Um, and that's almost a consensus uh, set of recommendations. <coughs> I would point out, though, that uh, Social Security and Medicare are heavily uh, income related already in the benefit formula. And uh, on the Medicare side, <coughs> Social Security uh, increasingly subject to <coughs> capture from the income tax. Um, so, you know, there may be a little bit more to gain there, but I think um, there's, there's social equity reasons for uh, thinking about that, but that's not going to solve the problem by itself. So, uh, health care, working longer, Social Security, and then certainly um, we've got to do something serious about savings. We have to get people uh, to save earlier, and uh, I agree with the uh, default approach. Uh, defined benefit pensions are going to be a thing of the past. Uh, we've got to be serious about making defined contribution systems work. 
And then finally, uh, the point that I think jumps out of this report uh, that no one's mentioned is the uh, freight uh, social safety net for low income people in this country. And, uh, we're going to have a lot of low income retirees. We have a lot today. Uh, we could have even more in the future. Um, we're going to need to really pay attention to programs like SSI and Medicaid, uh, food stamps, uh, housing assistance. Uh, those are absolutely critical, and it's uh, a shame on us that in a wealthy economy, in a rising economy, uh, we've allowed uh, this group, about 25% of the population, uh, to get into a place where they're absolutely going to be dependent on uh, these kinds of programs. So those five things, to me, are the uh, big takeaways from this report. Um, we have about 15 minutes, um, so why don't we uh, open up <coughs> some questions or some comments, and uh, yeah, uh, Steve, congrats on your work on housing. Uh, thank you, great job. Bruce on with the American Homeowners Foundation. Uh, specifically question for Deanna, but also for all of you. Uh, nobody has mentioned uh, economic competitiveness as a priority. <coughs> In my parents' silent generation, all the auto industry were adding jobs, adding jobs, adding jobs. Recently, uh, General Motors, I think it was, announced the huge staff reductions with incentives heavily aimed at encouraging the older boomers to retire. One of your three points in that last slide addressed the health care cost, is certainly an important one, and that might level off the way they incentivize or decide who to cut. The fact is, if they cut less older workers, or they let fewer older workers voluntary, voluntarily retire, those jobs are gone anyway. Some Gen Xs are going to go, and some Gen Ys are going to go. So how are we going to solve the problem of working longer if we don't do something to create more jobs going forward? Well, I think you could, I, I would come to that question from a couple of different angles. Um, one is that um, when we think about the forces that have made the U.S. competitive over time, uh, they've really been linked to the things that have kept the U.S. productive over time. And so if you think about um, GDP and GDP growth, you kind of break it down into two components. How much of it is inputs, labor inputs, capital inputs, and what is the productivity of those inputs over time? Uh, and I think this boomer issue raises at the one hand, if you hold productivity constant, the question of how much labor are you putting against the problem? And if we uh, don't, in the absence of all these boomers retiring and a smaller generation following, figure out how to keep that labor input sufficiently, even if we did nothing else on productivity, we would see our prosperity decline. Um, the, the, the next branch of this, of course, is the productivity picture. And, and you know, there's a huge debate a different debate, but linked debate today as to whether um, uh, exposure to, to global competition <coughs> improves our productivity prospects or doesn't, uh, uh, whether the uh, competitive structure of a lot of our sectors in the economy uh, are the reason we have been so productive or is the reason we should fear, et cetera. And in separate work that McKinsey Global Institute has done, we have, um, I think, very compellingly put forth a point of view that the competitors of the nation is going to be defined primarily through the degree of innovation that we're going to bear, not just in sex and products and otherwise, but in uh, <coughs> improvements in processes and otherwise that, that thrive when you're under competitive pressure uh, of different sorts. And that's something the U.S. has actually excelled at. Um, today's political debate worries me terribly because it's all about uh, protection in the name of competitiveness. Uh, let's limit the degree to which our businesses are exposed to competition. Otherwise, I think that's actually a bigger threat to our long-term competitiveness than some of these um, labor issues. In the long run. I would say, though, that um, if we com compare the U.S. experience to the European experience, there's a, there's a warning uh, here, which is that in some ways, uh, Europe, as a way to solve some of their labor <coughs> uh, market issues, stepped in with very clear mandates about what labor could and shouldn't do, uh, what was allowed, what wasn't working hours, non working hours, benefits, not working, and created a very inflexible labor market in many markets that has cost them dearly in the form of very high unemployment and uh, less potential for innovation. And I think as we solve these problems of um, enabling people to work longer, we have to keep those lessons in mind. Let's not create inflexibility in the marketplace. Let's actually just remove disincentives to work as opposed to mandating 
uh, that certain things be a certain way. Otherwise, oh, we'll fall into some of the under competitive issues that we see our neighbors in Europe uh, face uh, played out in productivity and labor as well. You know, I, I would say one thing about this, which is very abstract and something you might think about. <coughs> Most studies that show <coughs> McKinsey has done this show that um, uh, once you get past a certain age, and it depends on what industry you're in, you're, you know, your your value as an employee um, starts to go down. Um, I know it's happening with me. And, uh, <laughs> You know, it happens with a lot of you. Physical, obviously, physical work, you, you, you understand that, but it's true in, even in white collar work. And we actually, although we have the most flexible labor market probably in the industrial world, um, we might be able to think about um, pay systems that better reflect your productivity um, at, at each point in time. In the old days, when we all worked for one company for our whole life, it didn't matter that. Uh, you know, you basically you overpaid young people, you overpaid very old workers, and you underpaid people in the middle. But if you stayed at the same company your whole life, it was sort of fair because it didn't matter over, over the long period of time. That was fine. But if you're jumping around from company to company your whole career, it's probably more efficient to get paid what you're worth. We still have pay systems so that it's really terrible to reduce someone's pay after they get after the age of 57 or 58 or 60. It's just terrorist. It's just discriminatory. It's illegal. Mm -hmm. But in fact, maybe they're not worth as much. Maybe they don't work as hard. Maybe they're not as productive. <laughs> and maybe, maybe it would be good. <laughs> maybe it would be good to allow a little more flexibility that reflects uh, the fact we on the on the on the on the young end, we're already doing this, and I, I'm not sure we're doing it perfectly. But uh, you know, there's a lot of people now that get very low-paying entry jobs, and they call them internships. Um, uh, and it may be a, a form of slave labor. It may be reflecting the reality that when you first come into a place, you're not really very valuable. Um, you're actually a net drain on on the, on the company. But after a few years, once you learn something, then you're worth something. Well, maybe there's something about that at the end. And the point of this is just saying that, you know, you know, we had this thing a few years ago where old people going to work as greeter and greeters at Walmart was considered a bad thing. Well, I don't know, I haven't been to Walmart that many times, but the greeters <laughs> seem to be having a good time, you know? <laughs> Some income. And did they make as much as they used to make in their former job? No. But uh, they were productively employed, they were earning something. And maybe we ought to start being a little less judgmental about this, a little less labor union oriented in our view about pay and age, um, and uh, be a little more flexible in our um, systems. And maybe that way you wouldn't be always letting off the oldest people at a firm, which might actually have negative consequences for the firm in terms of what people know. Um, maybe you would have a more balanced way of cutting your work. All right, John. Okay, so we've done quite a bit of work on uh, how employers value older persons. And, and I, I think it's fair to say that um, for people in certain industries, um, older persons are more valuable than middle-aged uh, because their uh, relationship skills are better, because they're more loyal to the employer, and because they, frankly, have a stronger work, work ethic. Uh, so is that morally I, superior generation? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm afraid Bill's got a point there. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, age doesn't really explain <coughs> what's going on. I, I really think it is a more individual, uh, individual industry, individual company, individual employee, not about age. <coughs> and that's the standard under the Age Discrimination Employment Act. It's, it's, uh, you're not supposed to treat people as if everyone is of uh, declining productivity, I think you yourself, Steve, are a good example of just the opposite. So uh, let's, let's, let's not take a uh, everyone at a certain age should be paid less approach. I'm all in favor of more flexible arrangements, but we can do that with, with, uh, without you know, going to an age-based uh, system. I, I don't know whether it's a legal thing, John. It, it, it's in many ways a cultural thing. Um, if you, have an, if you have a conversation with your, you get to be 62 and you have a conversation with your employer um, and 
you, you might be able, you, you know, you might agree that, no, I'm not as productive as I used to, but I'm still valuable. Well, let, let's, let's me work fewer hours and let me get paid less. Yeah. That, and that, that, that would be fine, but if, there, right. if, if, if that's considered bad, if that's, if just <coughs> putting aside the legal, if, if we have a sort of mentality that I never take a pay cut, mm -hmm. um, that's maybe the wrong mentality at that time, if you like. That's a good one. Um, uh, my name is Carolyn Poplin. I was born in 1947, um, and I work for the Center for American Progress. I have a question about savings. Um, I've been to any number, I'm a widow, um, I'm living on a small federal pension, um, I've been to any number of financial planners, and they say, well, you're going to need this in retirement, so therefore what you need to do with your little nest egg is put 90% of it into the stock market, and we can help you do that. Um, and <laughs> to me, that's not saving. That's gambling. Um, when I got out of school in the early 70s, the <coughs> conventional wisdom was, don't put in the market money you can't afford to lose. And I, no, I haven't heard from anyone um, an idea of how we can save safely. Um, if you put your money in the bank, people think you're an idiot. You know, it's, it's amazing <coughs> the number of people who write to me with that same question. It's, I, I'm flabbergasted by it. One of the things that I'm actually surprised at <coughs> is that the market hasn't created all sorts of products for you. And I don't think that they have because no, I think haven't. you know about it. I mean, there is a thing called an insurance company, and insurance companies write things called annuities. And if they could say, if you give us this nest egg, whatever your nest egg is, here's what it will amount to per month for the rest of your life for as long as you live. Yeah, there are such products. There are such products, and I and have there's one. no reason why they can't take the risk, spread it over large numbers of people, and get the and, and assume the 10% return or 9% return and take a little bit of a profit for themselves. Well, what they were paying uh, was 2%. Right. Um, and then there was the variable that's what part. I don't and that was why the market hasn't solved this problem because. There are a lot of people who would like to do what you do. Now, you know, obviously sometimes when you take an nest egg and you try to commit and con con annuitize it, we're all sort of, we look at it, when we get the answer for what it is per month, it's we're not all disappointed. Very much. Right. But, um, but it's amazing that there aren't better products for that that are less, uh, that don't, don't take so much money for the, uh, for the insurance company. Isn't but adverse selection a huge part of what? Yes. 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 So again, if it was mandated, Yes. Well, that's eliminate the problem. That's called Social Security. Yes. Well. <laughs> <laughs> except, except, except we do not allow the Social Security trustees to put any money into the stock market where they could have earned, you know, a, a more decent return. And you know, we can have an argument about whether that's a good idea. I don't think even John, you would not necessarily oppose a certain amount of that. Canada, Canada does it uh, and has done well. Right. So there's no, um, you know, I mean, this is one of these conversations that, for some reason, Alan Greenspan took it off the table that it, somehow it violates some religious, uh, you know, <laughs> religious dictate that God forbid the government should take our money and put it in a stock index that there would be somehow the beginning of socialism in Sweden here if they did that. You know, that's a ridiculous idea, and it's, it costs us all a lot of money by clinging to that sort of religious uh, stuff. Let's hear from some of the three. Um, I'm just finishing a paper on the same topic, and uh, while I haven't nailed down the conclusions yet, I think there'll be, uh, things are pretty bad, but not quite as bad as Ms. Farrell suggested. Uh, two things strike me that I think haven't been emphasized enough. One bell started to get into and that is the enormous diversity of needs out there. You can look at a particular income level and say the requirements <coughs> vary by a factor of five easily. You know, did you pay off your mortgage? Did you have kids right. in college? Do you have a DV plan? And then the most paradoxical one of all, if you saved a lot, you don't need as much because you've lived a frugal lifestyle. Right. Um, the second thing that strikes me, if all you use is this 80% goal, then some of the people best prepared for retirement are at the very bottom of the income distribution. The bottom 15% can pretty much do it entirely on Social Security. At the other end, if the rule says you should have saved $1.2 million and you only saved a million, I can't get very concerned. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think the people we really have to be concerned about are, well, 
some of them are out in the middle, but I think the ones at the bottom who, you know, by all standards, are fully are prepared. Fully prepared. Yeah. Because Social Security they equals weren't prepared 80%. for life. That's right. the main problem. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. Um, I, our time is up, um, so thank you all for uh, coming. And, uh,